pleasure to introduce Ed Miliband, Leader of the Opposition and Leader of the Labour Party. Thank you. Well, John, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for that uh, kind reception. And it is great to be here at the Federation of Small Business Conference. Uh, it is a real privilege uh, for me to be here. Uh, as uh, Simon said, I gather I've had two warm-up speakers in, uh, <laughs> in George Osborne and, uh, and Nick Clegg. Uh, it does remind me, apparently, because we're obviously there is an election on, of the old uh, US bumper sticker, which I think you can take some comfort in. Uh, and it used to say, cheer up, only one of them can win. Uh, <laughs> maybe that, yeah, <laughs> I thought that might get a round of applause. Uh, maybe that will, uh, some comfort to you. Uh, look, I, I want to seriously thank, uh, I want to thank Mike Cherry, the FSB National Policy Chair. I want to thank John Allen, uh, your chairman, for all they do in standing up for small business. But I also want to thank all of you, most particularly, because you are the wealth creators of the country. You do incredible work day in, day out. You rarely get thanks for it. And I want to put on record my thanks to you for everything you do for the country. And what's most important is that your businesses generate the profits and wealth that our country need and are so often uh, so important to the future of the country. And often in the hardest of circumstances, particularly in the last few years. So thank you. And I know also that times are still hard for many small businesses uh, around Britain, and I want to put that on record. But I also know this, that for our country to succeed and for us to build a country that works for all and not just for some, your success is absolutely vital. And that's what I want to talk about today. Over the last five years, we've sought to work with you, to work with the FSB to develop our policy agenda led by our Shadow Business Secretary, Chuka Omuna, uh, and our Small Business Shadow Minister, Toby Perkins, uh, who was himself a small business owner. We've listened, and we're determined to build a Britain that supports your desire to grow, make profits, and help create a better future for the country. And I want to set out today our agenda if we win the general election. I do want to be clear, though, about one thing at the outset. We'll only change things when we think there is a gain from change. Because I know that one of the banes of your life is governments of both parties coming into office and simply changing things for the sake of it. I want to give you one very concrete example. This government abolished regional development agencies set up by the last Labour government and put local enterprise partnerships in place. Now, the easy thing for us to do would be to kick over the traces and return to where we were before. We won't. We'll build on what's there. Not because we thought the government made the right decision in abolishing RDAs, but because we know that the disruption caused by a whole new set of structures is frankly not worth the bother, and it's better to build on local enterprise partnerships, and that's what we'll do. Now, thank you. Now, this is the common sense approach that I want to characterize what we do. But having said that about some things that aren't going to change, I think there are some areas where we do need change, and I want to talk about four of them today. I want to talk about how we cut the costs that you face. I want to talk about how we stand with you against those who seek to take advantage of small businesses. I want to talk about reforming our banking system so you can get the finance that you need to support you. And I want to talk about the skilled workforce that I know you value and you need. <coughs> Let me start with the costs of doing business. We all know the story now about business rates and the impact that it's having. And I'm glad to say, actually, that this is increasingly becoming shared across political parties. As the FSB general election manifesto document set out, rates have increased by an average of £1,500 since 2010. And I know that for many of you, business rates have gone up, but your incomes or property values have fallen. And sometimes, and I meet small businesses who say this to me, business rates are now higher than rents. That's certainly not the way they were designed. We support the government's review into business rates, but I want to go further. When it comes to cutting taxes for businesses, we will put small businesses 
first in line. So, so, so if we win the election, we will straight away cut business rates and then freeze them again next year. Saving an average of 400 pounds for one and a half million businesses. But that's only the start. Because I think there's a much wider issue here. Too often, small businesses are not getting the treatment they deserve from government or sometimes from larger businesses. And I want to talk about that today. Take energy. 18 months ago, I said we needed to deal with what was happening in the broken energy market. Now, at the time, I think some people thought that doubted whether change really needed to happen. Again, I think we've seen a transformation. There's a widespread acceptance that change does need to take place. And I believe that events since then have proved the need to act. For example, over the last year, we've seen a 20% fall in wholesale prices. That's the costs facing energy companies. I don't think any of you in this room would say you've seen a 20% fall in the bills that you pay as small businesses. For me, that is a symptom of a market that's not working. That's why we'll freeze energy bills until 2017, so that prices can only fall and cannot rise. And by this winter, we will also give the regulator the power, a new power, to cut bills so that wholesale price falls are passed on to you in lower prices. Because we've got to end the situation where when wholesale prices go up, your bill rockets upwards, but when wholesale prices come down, your bill doesn't show the same fall. And it's not simply about dealing with the headline price issue, but also some of the practices that have been allowed to go on for too long. So we will legislate to give small business equal protection to households in the energy market. Let me tell you what that means. We'll end rolling over contracts without consent, which still happens. We'll place a requirement on energy companies to take into account the ability of small businesses to pay off debts. And we will give the new regulator a clear remit to protect the interests of small business. So standing with you means standing up to the energy companies. Standing with you also means dealing with the scandal of late payment and charges. Let's be clear about this. This is a national scandal. According to the government's own figures, 44% of small and medium-sized businesses had a problem with late payments last year, with the average small business being owed over £30,000. Now, the FSB's manifesto for the next government sets out how late payments hamper your ability to invest and grow, and how in some cases can threaten your very existence. The last Labour government gave small businesses the right to charge interest on late payments, but we know that that might be the law, but too many small businesses can't enforce the right that you have. And I know you often worry about the impact on your relationship with large suppliers. At this conference last year, I announced the next Labour government will give business organisations like the FSB the legal right to represent you, and we will go further. We will bring in requirements for large firms to report on their record on late payments, including the action they have taken to compensate suppliers. I'm pleased this is something the government has also endorsed today. Let me also add this, though, because this is something that John and Mike and I talked about earlier. We've also got to make sure that government puts its house in order, because I know that the issue of government late payments remains a problem, not meeting the directive, uh, and not actually putting into practice what we preach to others. So government needs to put its house in order as well. Now, recent events have also highlighted a problem in addition to late payments, which also needs dealing with. And that's pay-to-stay pay charges from large firms for you to join or stay and stay on their supplier list. I know we all believe in a simple principle. You should be paid for the products that you produce, not what face what the FSB has called supply chain bullies. I can't be clear about this. It's wrong and it must end, and if it is necessary to legislate to end it, we will do so. So on business rates, on late payments, and unfair charges, these are just some of the challenges facing small businesses that we will act on. But let me also say this. Government constantly needs to learn from you about what would make life better 
for small businesses. It's why we will establish a small business administration based on the one they have in the United States, putting the interests of small businesses right at the heart of government, fighting your corner, standing up for you, and holding government to account for the way it treats small businesses. The Small Business Administration will have a remit to ensure regulations are designed with small firms in mind. And there's one change we already know that we need. And that's in respect of the way HMRC works. Uh, and I remember this was talked about in our session at the conference last year. Many of you have told me that HMRC seems to treat businesses like yours one way and large firms another way. You pay taxes on your hard-earned profits and HMRC chases you for every single penny. And at the same time, you watch when large firms seem to have sweetheart deals and don't play, pay, play by the same rules. That's why we've announced a review into the customs and practices of HMRC. And we are determined, and this is something the next Labour government will do, we are determined to end the situation where you pay more because some large firms are not paying their fair share. It's not right, it's not fair, and it's not just. So we'll reduce business rates, we'll stand with you when the public and private sector don't play fair. And we want to have a banking system that properly supports you. Too often businesses like yours are made to feel like you serve the banks rather than the banks serving you. So we'll create a British investment bank to support new regional banks. Now the purpose of these banks is very specific and it's learning from other countries including Germany. It's to provide lending to small and medium sized businesses. Helping businesses wherever they are in the country, in each region, and helping rebalance our economy. And we will have a market share cap so we can have more competition in business banking on the high street. Because frankly, our banking sector is still highly concentrated compared to other countries. And the reason that's a problem is it means less choice for you. Finally, let me talk about skills, because I know all of you care deeply about your workforce. It's not just finance that you need to innovate and grow. It's skilled people, especially skilled young people. And I think this is actually a national mission, to give our young people the skills they need. Because when young people don't have the skills they need, it's a disaster for them, it's a massive problem for your businesses, and it's a tragedy for the country. And I know all of you care deeply about the future of young people in our country. That's why our plan has at its heart this idea, which is that we shouldn't just have training and education and skills for some of our young people, but training and education for all of our young people. And this is the most important and the most difficult task of all. It's got to be in vocational and not just academic qualifications. Because, because this is... This is a decades-long problem, uh, and it's so clear, I think, when you look at the history of Britain, which is failing to recognize that both vocational and academic qualifications matter to the future of the country. Now, what does that mean in practice that we would do? We'd return work experience to the curriculum, because I think young people need to know what actually uh, running a business is like and being part of a business is like. We'd have maths and English until 18. We'd have a new gold standard technical baccalaureate. Why? because we want young people at the age of 14 to know what they're aiming for. Currently, if you're going down the academic route of GCSEs and A-levels, you know where you're going. I think it's much harder to say if you're a 14-year-old what the gold standard vocational route is. And we'd introduce new technical degrees at our universities. So our young people know what they're aiming for and firms like yours can get the skills they need. And above all, overturning this idea that there's some iron curtain between vocational and academic education or that somehow academic education is first class and vocational education is second class. We've got to have proper parity of esteem as a country if we're going to succeed and do right by our young people. So, so let me say finally, this is what we offer. Fairer business rates as part of a fairer deal for small business. Seeking to have your voice at the heart of government. Access to finance and the skills you need. And all of these plans are underpinned by a plan to reduce the deficit every year and balance the books. Because I know that economic stability matters for you. 
Now, that will mean, will mean reductions in public spending outside key areas like health and education, cutting costs as you've done over the last few years. Let me say this last of all. I know that so many of you work all the hours that God sends for your businesses. And I know that whatever happens at the next election, you want a government that will respect your effort and seek to do all we can to make life that little bit easier. That is what the next Labour government would seek to do. And let me also say this, just as we've had dialogue with the FSB, which I've really valued in opposition, so we would continue that into government. I don't say that we'll always agree, but we will always seek to listen. We'll always seek to understand your perspective. Because we know that to create a country that truly works for all, we need public and private sectors, government and small business working together. And that means your voice has got to be at the heart of what government does. Thank you very much for your time today. Right, I'm now going to take, uh, I'm now going to take questions. And, uh, yep, there's all this gentleman waving at me. Uh, yep, number three. Do you want to just say your name? Thank you, Mr. Miliband. Uh, my name is Raul Mancera. I'm a chairman of the London North East branch of the FSB. Uh, when it comes to regeneration, uh, the small businesses are the very first one to be badly affected. Um, and many of them get killed during the whole process. This is the case that we're having now in my area, in Tottenham, London, where uh, we have cases like Spurs and World's Corner. My question is, what will you do to help us if you win the election? And will you be willing to come and visit these businesses yourself personally and commit to them before the elections? Let, let me ask you to just hold the microphone for a second. So this is basically when you have a redevelopment in an area. You're saying it's a re redevelopment slash regeneration in an area, and small businesses are being incredibly hard hit by the, by the change and redevelopment that's taking place? Is that what you're... Yes, exactly. They will be kicked out. Uh, they were promised to have um, a, a place back during three years afterwards, uh, and they are invited to pay a very much higher rent than they're paying at the moment. Okay, well, look... The, the best thing I should say, I can say to you, is obviously I'm not going to be able to specifically change that redevelopment, but I think what is important is that if you furnish me with the details, I will talk to your local member of parliament, who I think might be David Lammy, I'm not sure. Yes, he is. Uh, is, he, is he on the case on this? Oh. I'll make sure he gets on the case. Please, uh, please uh, do. Uh, 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 <laughs> let, let me... Uh, let, let, if, I get your, if we get your details afterwards, sure. I'll find out about the specific circumstances of what's happening. And I'll also, let's try and work out whether there's a more general lesson about, about government policy more widely uh, in terms of your experience. What about the second question? Will yeah. you be willing to come and, and visit the businesses yourself and commit I, to them? I don't want to set elections? a trend for every questioner, but look, I will, <laughs> I, I, I'll definitely I'll look at your invitation, definitely. Thank definitely, you. Thank definitely. you. Okay, let's take a... Uh, there's a lady who's waving at me just behind, yeah. Thank you, um, Anne-Marie Abbott from, um, oh, sorry. Anne-Marie Abbott from um, East Yorkshire um, Committee. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if signing the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership is um, only going to, in effect, give a back door to um, foreign businesses coming in and taking over from some of our British businesses. Interesting question. Okay, let me, Anne-Marie, let me, uh, let me deal with that uh, question. Look, I'm in favor of the so-called TTIP, uh, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Uh, in principle, I'm in favor of it. Because I think that if you think about the, for example, our place in the European Union, I think one of the benefits of it, the European Union needs to change, but one of the benefits of being in the EU is, is trade. But look, I think what's important about what you say is we do need to look at the impact of TTIP. And we need to look at the impact on small businesses. I actually think that, in principle, it should be of benefit to small businesses. I notice in the FSB manifesto that they are uh, supporting uh, TTIP. So, so I think, in principle, it should benefit uh, small businesses. But we've got to make sure, as in anything, that the rules are fair, right, and it's a genuinely level playing field. 
and that small businesses don't lose out. You'll be aware maybe that there's an issue in relation to the NHS, which people have raised in, in, regard, to, uh, in regard to TTIP. And again, I suppose that's a sort of another example. So whether it's public services or small business, my, my position is in favour of TTIP, but let's make sure it actually works for small businesses in this country and you don't get sort of hard done by, sort of either by accident uh, of, the, or, of the agreement. Let, let me take number four um, uh, over there. Good afternoon. Hello. D David Ramsden, the Wessex Regional Treasurer. SBA, Small Business Administration in America, works very well because the administrator has a seat in President Obama's cabinet. Now, when I asked Chucker the question a year or so ago, he would not give a commitment, but said it would probably be part of biz. The whole thing about SBA and why it works so well in America is that the administrator has a seat in the cabinet. Will your SBA minister have a seat in the cabinet? I'm really glad I called you. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, Look, I think I, we should look at that. I'm not going to, if, if you'll forgive me, because uh, I think credibility in politics is low enough that I, I shouldn't make false promises. Uh, I'm not going to promise my sort of cabinet today, but I think, I think you make a genuinely important point, which is the SBA in principle is a good idea and is an important idea, but the question you're asking, and the cabinet is one way of doing it, the question you're asking is, is it going to ha have teeth or is it going to be toothless? I mean, if it's in some corner of Whitehall and nobody can quite remember where the office is and what the person's doing, that's not going to work. So, look, my commitment to you would be, I can't give you the commitment on the Cabinet today, but what I can give you a commitment on is we, we, I will take this away and we've got to make sure that with the SBA it is genuinely at the heart of government and not on a sideline. Because if it's a sideline, then it's not going to be worth having. If it's real and as part and, and at the heart of government, uh, and there's clearly a question about where it is, which I think is a question we are still looking at, where should it be, where is it going to have most influence, um, then I think it can have an impact. So I, I think it's a really, really kind of important point that you've made. Let's take, uh, let's take some more. Uh, yes, uh, there's somebody in the front row. Yep. I've slightly, I've slightly kiboshed the numbers, haven't I? I'm sorry about that. I've just sort of randomly taking people, yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm quite, um, I, I find it, I get a bit nervous on the old mic, so I find you I have to bear I with do, me. I do as well, actually, so. Uh, <laughs> so, uh. so, like you said, we talk about um, business rates, yep. and we talk about getting out of debt, that's mainly what the governments talk about, but I don't understand why we don't take back, back what's ours, and we take back the Bank of England, because at the end of the day, we will never get out of debt while, the, while there's an organisation printing our money. In the, the day, if you charge interest on our money, that doesn't actually exist, you will never be able to pay it back. So how are we going to get out of a debt that's un unsustainable? But what's your name? Stefan. Stefan what, from what, Simply IT. What, what's your company? Um, Simply IT. What, tell me about Simply IT. So we are um, an IT and telecoms provider in Northamptonshire. We work with a lot of schools from Milton Keynes, Bedfordshire, and we basically do all their IT and telecoms. Very good. Anyone who wants their IT knows where to go. Um, let's take another t couple of questions. There's a lady here. Yeah, in the middle. Hi, my name's um, Sue Nelson from um, Kenton Medway. Hi, Sue. Um, we've got over 6,000 members in our lovely county. Uh, we survey them quite often, and their top banana issue is broadband. Um, and uh, it's not just a rural issue. It really isn't a rural issue, necessarily. Um, would your, if you were in government after May, is it something that you would look at seriously and how would you deal with the issue of BT monopolising the fact that often we can't get what we want? How bad is it in, in your area? Um, just, I'll just give you an example. Um, I have to go and make a cup of tea when I download a document. Um, and actually, That's not I, so need, good really, is it? No, I need 20 to 30 times that sort of speed. And just from my point of view, businesses will be much more efficient, they'll be much more innovative, we'll be much more competitive as a country if we really, truly had access to amazing fibre. So it's less a... It's so, so this is... So in a way, the, the stuff that about how far it's rolled out is actually quite misleading, because it's sort of rolled out, but it's not... It's rolled out to you, but it's at cup of tea speed, so it's not, not, not so useful. Is that the I, problem? I think the issue is we're all dependent on BT, and because they have right. a monopoly, yeah. I think that makes it quite difficult yeah. to have truly competitive okay. uh, broadband okay. service. 
Good, good, is it something that you would look at good question. in government? Good question. Steve. Are you going to answer it, though? Yeah, I am. I am. I'm going to take three. <laughs> uh, I promise you. I promise you. Uh, I should have. I, tou touche. I should have said I'm going to take three questions, and I promise you, if I don't answer it, then you can That's you can right. heckle me. Um, and there's a lady. I'm just trying to get more people in. There's a lady here. I'm going to answer the Bank of England question as well once once I think of an answer to it. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 I wonder, where's Ed Balls when you need him? Yeah. Uh. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Patricia Marks from Somerset and Wiltshire region. Um, we've had a number of high-profile speakers today, and you have all confirmed that we are the backbone of the British economy Excellent. and that we create the wealth, and that's absolutely welcome to hear. Um, There's but a we but coming, isn't there? <laughs> There's a big but. Um, in our region, um, like you say, representing Somerset and Wiltshire, the biggest issue we have is dealing with the public sector. And it's not about late payments, it's about the attitude towards small businesses. Time and time again, you've said, <laughs> all of you that have come today, which I'm delighted that you've all been here and it shows the prestige that everybody feels about the FSB, is that we create the wealth and we create the money to pay for public services and then they beat us up. They beat us up in terms of when we look for planning applications, when we try to deal with lots of different issues. It takes weeks and weeks and weeks. Businesses deal a lot faster than that. We've got so many issues and so many examples that we could give you. I can give you a classic example that I actually witnessed in a business last week with EHO, where they sat down in a business and absolutely tried to annihilate them in front of their customers. Yes. Over what issue, Patricia? It was in a cafe. And they decided to take over this cafe and sit down in front of the customers and try to explain everything. Hang on a second. Yes, we realise there must be regulation. Yes, we realise there must be rules in how we do things. But it's, we feel beaten up all of the time because it's actually, they, we seem to be working for them rather than the other way round. How can we address this at a very, very local level? Well, let me start, let me start with that uh, question. And I don't, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't have a simple answer, but I think it is an important question that you raise. It, it seems to me it's sort of what you might call a sort of empathy gap, isn't it? It's that they're not thinking, these local organisations, local bureaucracies are not thinking about what it means. I, I had this experience in relation to my own, well, I'll give you two examples actually locally, which are maybe instructive about the, the challenge. One, which is a local company in my constituency, which is, uh, makes doors, and they have actually, one of the things they're trying to do is get contracts with the public sector, but the council, they couldn't get a contract with, with our local council. And you know, one of the things I tried to do, and it's really hard, is to say, well, hang on, why aren't they looking to help to, to actually kind of, you know, support this local company. But then let me give you another example, which in a way sums up the dilemma. I've also got a company called Doncaster Cables in my uh, constituency that's been fighting the issue of, and there may be people in this audience who've had this issue too, cables that are being imported from abroad which are at lower standards, perhaps not at the right standards. Now their complaint is actually less about bureaucrats engaging too much, but engaging too little. So, so <laughs> Now, that's not meant to be a sort of cop-out. It's more just trying to kind of work out how you deal with this. Look, the best thing I can say is this, and maybe it goes to the SBA uh, point that uh, was made earlier. It seems to me that the lesson I learned from talking to lots of you is that the issue is not simply regulation, but the way regulation is enforced. That in the end, and, and that maybe, maybe the centre's got to take a lead. Is it gold-plated? Is it done with empathy or without it? Uh, is it understanding the situation of a small business? And, and look, maybe the best that can be said is that the SBA, at the heart of government, maybe in the cabinet, uh, at, the heart, at the heart of government, can actually, can actually, if you like, lead that culture change. Because I think it's culture change that is the thing that is required. If you've got other thoughts about how we make it happen, please, you're nodding, uh, uh, please do. It's about attitude. Yeah, and it's about attitude. No, and I, t I, totally, I totally get that. Um, so, Sue, your question. Look, there is a clearly a big challenge in relation... Where's Sue who asked the question? Yeah. Uh, there is clearly a big issue about broadband. 
And, uh, by the way, I think there's a big issue about mobile phone coverage as well. I sort of think you can put a man on the moon, but you can't have proper mobile phone coverage. Uh, you know, it, it, it can't be beyond the wit, wit of people to make, to, make that, uh, uh, to make that happen. I think we do need to look at broadband and need to look at what we can do. It's complicated, so I'm not going to make up a policy on the hoof here, but I'm conscious of it. You know, it's a bit like, you know, highways 100 years ago. You know, this, is, this is like the, the kind of the, the absolute heart of running a successful business, and we can't leave it to chance. And we can't leave you having to make a cup of tea while you wait for something to download. Uh, and so, you know, I think it is, we, we, we're on the case on it. Just a question that was asked about the, um, uh, about the Bank of England. Look, the, uh, you need a central banking system. Every country has a central uh, banking system. My, my issue about the banking system is, is sort of less its status and its sort of ownership, if you like, because you have a central bank, an independent central bank, most countries do, it's more, does the banking system itself see itself as your servant or its own servant? And look, financial services is a really important industry in its own right, but the unique thing about financial services is it's also supposed to provide the lifeblood of the economy, uh, and that's to you, and finance to you. And I don't think we're nearly done with the change and the reform and the improvements we need in our banking system. Because I think that so many small businesses I meet, and I don't know what your experience has been, say we can't get the finance, we can't get the help, we're borrowing on overdraft, we're borrowing on a credit card, we're just, we're just not getting the time of day. The point of the business investment bank with the regional banking system, they have it in, uh, in Germany, the so-called Sparkassen system, is to actually say we need the public sector to actually play a bit of a role here in having small and medium-sized businesses properly served by regional, uh, by regional banks. Let, let me take another, um, oh, there are lots of people now. Uh, uh, yep, there's a lady, uh, a lady here, sort of wearing red. Get extra points for red, you see. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Uh, Hi, I'm Jane Binion, and I'm from Lancaster. Hi. And the first thing, I, I just want to make a point that um, as a single mom, it was working tax credits that enabled me to set up and start my business. Good. Um, and I think that's really important. I am not the only one. Of course, that has enabled lots of us to do that. I was in public sector and lost my job, like many people. Um, Thank you for saying that, Jane. The, uh, the thing I want you to do now... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, in a, I'm in the digital world. I'm in a very male-dominated world. Um, my 16-year-old daughter is doing computer science. There are only two girls doing it. We have a massive skill gap there. Um, and there's no reason why there's a gender issue, because it's so new. It's, it's crazy, there's a gender issue. So what I want to uh, say is, what are your thoughts on, A, addressing the digital skills gap anyway, but also about um, trying to bring girls and, and more women into this field. What's, your, um, what's been your experience? What, what, what is your business? It's, a, it's an IT business, is it? Or a um, I, I'm a trainer, and I train uh, people around digital, social media, um, understanding what people are saying to them when they're talking to them about their websites. So just addressing um, digital inclusion. Okay, great question. Thank you. I, I'm, I feel like I'm discriminating against people at the back. Um, oh, number five. Yep. Hello, I'm, I'm Andrew Postlethwaite, uh, Chair of the Teambridge branch in uh, South Devon. Hi, Andy. I'd like to ask you about zero-hours contracts. Um, as a small business, we need zero-hours contracts to help with our flexibility. We're not big enough to employ people full-time. We can't take the overhead. What I'd like to think, I've heard a lot about zero-hours contract between the different parties. Uh, what would you do with zero-hours contracts if you were Prime Minister? Can you hold the microphone for a second, Andy, because this is a really important point. Just tell me a little bit, if you wouldn't mind, about your experience with zero hours contracts. I don't know how long you've been using them, how, how you need them, because, because it sort of, I'll give you my answer, but I'd be interested in your experience. My business, um, I, I run a business that is not, the business I run reconstructs murder scenes for the police. So if murder see, if murders don't happen on a regular basis, I can't employ people to do the work. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Okay. Okay, this, this is... This is... This, okay, this, this is becoming one of the more unusual questions yeah. I've ever been asked. I think, it is, I think it is definitely fair to say. Uh, I've tried... Um, right, the floor is still yours, Eddie, yeah, just I, about. I, I, uh, I've tried job creation schemes, but they don't seem to work. Right. Um, the, point, the point being is I'm, I'm in a, a niche market, which... Uh, <laughs> thank goodness. Um, but it means that I cannot predict the future. I, I don't sell pens, so I can't say I'm going to sell so many pens this week, or my targets are this this week. So I, just, I need flexibility of being able to give call on staff and experts as and when I need them, rather than have them sat there as an overhead, twiddling their thumbs, waiting for the ambulance to go by. So that, that's a, it's a particular need on my I won't ask how you got into the business. No. <laughs> Right, okay. So, I, I'm not a typical example, but I think I, 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 think I, <laughs> I let me just ask you this illustrate question, the actually, issues. Serious, yeah. serious, serious question. So, you don't have people working month after month on zero hours contracts, because they are genuinely for like a few days here, and then a, a month later, a few days there. Is that right? That, that's right, yes. Okay. okay, well, I think that's a quite useful clue, actually. Uh, but, but clue uh, being the operative. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Word. Um, right, I'm still... Uh, yep, there's a gentleman here in the, in the blue shirt. Thank you very much. I'm David Coles, David Coles Architects. I actually met the guy behind you, oh, but don't you? worry at all. You, you, you carry on and You're then I'll next. get the guy behind you. <laughs> so I carry on. I was just going to ask... Please don't do a Clarkson and have a fight over the microphone. Not, as, be, not at all. unfortunate. No. I, I was going to ask you whether you would look into the accessibility Transparency, transparency and integrity of the public procurement systems. Uh, we've found ourselves bidding for public sector work um, and I can think of at least three occasions when the process has been abandoned and, and um, either it doesn't happen or it's passed to another agency. It's a great waste of our time and um, yes, yeah, very inefficient. And, uh, and, and do you think that's because you were a small business or, or just generally it was just screwed up? I think for my experience of it is that the, the procurement in these instances hasn't really been thought through. Uh, and there's a change of leadership perhaps in a council, um, which has meant that they've abandoned the process or they've passed it on to another agency. Okay. Um, somebody else who's perhaps running a What's framework. What's your business as a matter of interest? We're architects. Right. Oh, yes, you said that. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, good, good question. And then the gentleman behind you. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry, I've got a blue tie on. Don't worry. <laughs> Rather than red. Um, Me too, Gordon, actually, uh, you'll have noticed that. Gordon Millward, South and East Yorkshire Regional Chairman. My question is to do with the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. uh, the Labour Party, I believe, are saying it should be £8 an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, it could have a counteractive uh, result in that, that the people at the bottom of the learning tree will just not get the places, because if you have to pay £320 for 40 hours, it's not going to be paid. So if you get it too high on the minimum wage, it is going to be counterproductive, actually. Um, generally speaking, when you get into a trade, you're above the minimum wage anyway. So, and if some, there's a lot of retraining has to take place at the moment. So if you're retraining and you're not producing at the start, you need to have that flexibility to pay a lower wage while you're doing that training. But the minimum wage can get too high and be counterproductive. What's your business, Gordon? Or to electrical. Okay, thank you for your, thank you for those questions. Let me. Uh, the timer is telling me I've got six minutes, so I'll, I'll skip through these. And if there is time, I'll ask get another couple of questions in. So, Jane, thank you for your uh, question, and thank you for what you said about working tax credit. It is a big issue this for the country, which is how do we get girls into areas that have traditionally been areas for boys? Maggie Philbin actually. Uh, did a review for us on this issue, and it's worth you uh, looking at that, not on the specific issue of girls, but just generally about IT and how we get young people into IT, and I think she covered uh, this issue. I would say one of the things, it's sort of, I've touched on it in my speech, is work experience, and making sure that you have work experience in schools. But there's another thing I would say about education, just while we're on it, which is I think that there is a danger for the country that we take an incredibly narrow view of education. And that, look, I, I care about English and maths and all of that, but you know, computer science and, dare I say, it, design and technology, a whole range of art subjects, absolutely crucial to the future of the country. And therefore, you know, it, it's not just the kind of conventional academic 
subjects that, that matter. By the way, the other thing that people say, and I don't know whether you'd concur with this, we should be starting much earlier on coding, computer science, and all that in primary schools. Uh, and that actually it should, we shouldn't just wait till we get to secondary school. That in a way, we're still seeing it as, as like, oh, there's computer science over there, not as a fundamental part of what education is about. So that's sort of where I would say, but I think, I think really put, you know, working with schools to make sure that girls are part of these subjects, not just boys, seems to me to be fundamental. A Andy, thank you for your brilliant um, uh, question, a memorable, memorable uh, uh, question. So I think I've got a decent answer for you on, on zero hours contracts. Look, our point is this, which is what you don't really want is people on zero hours contracts months after month after month after month when they're actually doing regular hours so that zero hours contracts becomes a sort of route to kind of get people to do regular hours. And I don't actually think this is a big issue in most small businesses. I think it's actually some of the larger businesses, dare I mention Sports Direct, uh, who are doing this. And so I, I think it's, why do I say, this? some people might say, well, isn't that just flexibility? I'm in favor of flexibility, but I think there's a, there's a place you get to where the burden of risk is just only falling on the employee. And, and it, you know, if you're a large employer, I think some of the risk is gonna be borne by you because how do you plan for your family for the future if you don't know from one week to the next whether you're doing zero hours, you know, no hours, three hours, five hours. And by the way, there's a big issue about getting people into work in relation to this as well because I meet people from job center advisors who say, well, it's really hard because if the contract on offer is five hours or seven hours, that's gonna not, got not do it. I think we, our policy's got the flexibility to accommodate your somewhat unusual um, uh, circumstances. Um, on, the, uh, on David's question about procurement, well, isn't this about, isn't it, it slightly goes back to the question I was asked earlier about uh, local government. I mean, my sense is it's because they haven't done a very good job in, you know, that the that, that government is still you know, often quite rubbish when it comes to procurement. And, and sort of messes it up. Where, where, who asked the question on this, sorry? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, that, that it's about the quality of procurement and the quality of the input that goes into it is my, is my sense. And so you know, that's about, and, and, and we did take some steps when we were in government to improve this, but that seems to me to be the answer, is that you've got to improve the way procurement is done so you don't have to start over. Because why is that a problem? Because it's massive cost for businesses which you know, who've, who've done some work to try and get into the procurement and then don't, uh, and don't get ahead with it. Uh, sometimes, by the way, it's also because, dare I say it, government ministers change their minds about things or civil servants change their minds about things midway through a procurement. But I think it's just about having a high standard of procurement that is carried through. Gordon, who asked a question about the minimum wage, um, look, this is, this is important because there's a balance issue here that we've got to get, we've got to get, uh, right, where is, yes, yeah, here. here. Um, so we've got a plan to raise the minimum wage to eight pounds an hour by the end of the parliament. Now, why do I say by the end of the parliament? And it's, it's somewhat reflected in the FSB manifesto because we want to make sure that there's time to plan for businesses about the change that would happen in relation to the minimum wage. Because if we said eight pounds tomorrow, which some people would want us to say, people would say, well, hang on a minute. How, how, how are we gonna plan for that? What's the job implications gonna be? I think, I think the, the now, now then the other thing is, let me just say about the living wage, because I know that's a concern of people. I want to be clear about this. Our position on the living wage is an incentives position. We're going to say we'll give a tax incentive to employers who want to pay the minimum wage, living wage. It's not about forcing employers to pay uh, a living wage, because the minimum wage is the legal floor. Now, you've always got to be judicious about the balance here and what the level of the minimum wage is. I think the point I would make about why I believe the minimum wage is too low is it's very low as a proportion of average earnings compared to other countries. And also, not to put too fine a point on it, we're spending quite a lot of money as a country subsidizing the minimum wage in tax credits and benefits and so on. So I think you're totally right. This is something where we've got to get the balance right. And there are particular issues for small business. And I think we've got to recognize that. And I hope by us, if you like, setting a path over five years, not a sort of sudden move to eight pounds now will give businesses time to adapt and we'll get that balance right. My, my clock is saying 42 seconds, so I think that probably means that my, uh, my time is up. Um, look, I just want to say thank you very much for kind of having me here today. Uh, I'm not gonna say you're the backbone of Britain again because I'll get in trouble with the lady who, uh, uh, who, who, who asked me about that. But in all seriousness, look, I really appreciate what you do for the country 
all of you will recognize that it's what you might call an uncertain election. Um, but if I'm prime minister in 50 days' time, I, I do promise you dialogue and engagement. I've really valued what the FSB, and I do want to put, put, kind of pay tribute to the FSB here, because I think the FSB have done a brilliant job of engaging with us. Doesn't mean we get everything right, but I do promise you uh, engagement, uh, respect, and I think we have the same, I think this question and answer session has shown it, we have the same objectives for the country, and there's nothing that can stop Britain when we work together. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Uh, um, can I just ask you one quick question? Oh, yes. Did you say, I just wanted to clarify this, because we had the other two on this morning, yes. of course, and they said they would have an overhaul of the business rate, yeah, but yeah. It, would be, it would be fiscally neutral, so some would pay more and some would yeah. pay less. A cut and a freeze. Yes. Look, what we've said, just to be clear about this, that the government has said that their priority is to cut corporation tax from 21 to 20 percent. We've said that's not our priority. Our priority is actually to put a large proportion of that money into a business rates cut okay. because we think that that's the right thing to do. That is, that is more of a priority than a tax cut for the largest corporations. It's important to have a competitive tax rate for large corporations, but we think the bigger, more urgent priority now uh, is a business rates cut. Okay, some daylight there between Thank the you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, 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 Thanks. Thanks.